I'm going to venture to say that all of us are still reeling from the events of this week, still reeling from what happened in Las Vegas on Sunday night. Fifty-nine people lost their lives to gun violence. Fifty-nine more to put on the account of the dangers of the epitome, epidemic, actually, that gun violence represents in our country. Do you know how many deaths are due to gun violence in 2017 to date, so far? I've did a little research. Anybody has maybe wanted to look it up and figure it out? 11,600. I called it an epidemic because it is a matter of um, of health. And the CDC should be in charge of this. Can you imagine if there were, forget about 11,000, just 600 deaths in America due to the Zika virus? What would happen in this country if that would be the truth by next year? Just 600 Americans dying from the Zika virus. Do you know how up in arms we would be? We would be protesting in front of the White House. Everybody would be just ready to overthrow the government. You know, I mean, it would be such a huge thing. 11,600 deaths this year since January 1st. There's still three months to go. There's only been, actually, there have been under 3,000 3, casualties in all the years of the war in Afghanistan. That's to kind of put it in perspective. 273. 273 is the number of days since from January 1st this year to October, October 1st. 273 days. It's also the number of mass shootings that have happened since the beginning of the year as well in America. And mass shootings are Shootings that uh, include that, that um, where four or more people uh, were shot, not all of them to death, but all, four or more people were shot in one single event. 273, one mass shooting per day. I don't want to talk about that tonight. I mean, I'm going to reference tangentially to what's going on in this country, but I wanted to talk about something else. It is connected, obviously, but um, I wanted to share a beautiful conversation that I was privileged to participate in with uh, friends of mine uh, earlier this week. Um, she is a school teacher. She teaches sixth through eighth grade at a local uh, school in the northern part of Seattle. And following the events of Sunday night in Las Vegas, there were directives that were given to the teachers as they welcomed the kids back to school Monday and Tuesday, and knowing that they would be also um, probably deeply impacted and emotionally impacted by what they probably saw in the news over the weekend. And there were some very strong directives to share with the student, to share with the kids um, a single message. And that message was that they are safe. That they are safe. And it feels like it's the right sentiment, you know, why? Because those kids probably feel a little bit 
well, maybe a lot um, unsafe. And so we needed maybe to reassure them. And the school, maybe the district, decided that that was the message that was going to be shared as school started earlier this week. And my friend had, um, had issues with that. My friend really was wrestling with what the school or the district was, was really trying to convey, was really trying to do. I mean, she could see the, maybe the good-heartedness from which the decision was made that, that that was going to be the message to be shared with the students, but she could also see that it was imbalanced. She really questioned the, the truth of that message. She questioned the validity of that message. She questioned the reality of that message. She felt that perhaps there was a great opportunity that was missed by only focusing on the concept of being safe, in perhaps engaging those kids in a more meaningful conversation that included both the fact that they may be safe in the environment in which they live, but that in fact life is inherently unsafe and what a great opportunity to in fact engage them in such kind of meaningful conversation. She knew, she knew that you know, she's a teacher in, in a pretty affluent neighborhood, a pretty white neighborhood, and she knew that in fact if you were to compare these kids in that school with maybe other schools in other neighborhoods in Seattle or other parts in, of the country, these kids in fact lived in a pretty safe neighborhood, a pretty safe environment. So that was part of the truth. But that was not the whole truth. That was only half of the truth. And that in fact, there was a place to teach and share with compassion and understanding that being unsafe is also part of life. And that's really the issue with, with trying to shield our children from half of the reality of life. Because in doing so, we kind of set expectations for them that life should be safe. And when we do that, when we set this kind of expectations, we in fact impact them, we, we condition them with such expectations of the, perhaps, the inherent safety of life, and we don't allow them to actually wrestle with its opposite. And what happens when we do that, what happens when we do that is that when the naturally unsafe aspects of life show themselves for those kids that have learned uh, to look at life from a different perspective then this moments that are unsafe or unpalatable are are seen as ab an, as an aberration as as abnormal acts of god we call them um, accidents um, why bad things, sorry, why bad things happen to good people. War, murders, disease, famine, untimely death. All these are part of a true human experience of life. All these are often expression of the dark side of our humanity. And we are not doing any service to these kids by teaching them subtly, I mean not overtly, it's not overtly the message we are saying, but by focusing only on you are safe, we are also sending them a message that this other aspect, those darker aspects of the human experience are to be rejected, are to be seen as deviating from the norm.
Those are not normal parts of life. What is a normal part of life we're really saying is you're safe, life is good, and you're loved. And that is true, very much so. But that is not the whole truth. And I think we are doing great disservice to these kids. We are not preparing them. And I think schools are there to prepare our kids to face life as it is. Not as they have been conditioned to hope it will be, to believe it will be. And so down the line in 10 years from now, 20 years from now, when they are going to, because they are going to be faced with the unsafe nature of life, they will be unprepared. They will push it back. They will push it away. They will deny it. They won't want to see it. They will ignore it or they will, they will reject it. It will create a major dissonance in their being. There is beautiful light in the world and there is great darkness in the world. And that is life. That is reality. That is truth. And it doesn't just happen, you know, in our schools. It doesn't really just touch our children. I think it is pervasive. I think we see that in many different aspects of our society, in our corporate world, in, uh, in our communities. We see it really almost everywhere nowadays. This notion of, of wanting to be safe, of the, the inherent, maybe, safe nature of life, which is, which is a, a, something we maybe pursue, but it's not, it's not reality. It's not reality. We often see that, even in, in, in the spiritual circles, you know, we, we often see that. You, you go to a meeting, or you, you take part of um, a gathering, a circle, you know, where we are going to discuss great, powerful, beautiful topics, you know, things that are enlivening or important. If it's a uh, context of, of work, it could be one way. Whatever it is, we're going to, to debate, we're going to share together in in a specific topic, and, and the facilitator of the meeting, whatever the meeting is, oftentimes has a board, and ask people around, so before we engage in such conversation, what would be the ground rules for us to discuss this topic, so that we can, we can really be together and share from our heart. And if not the first, but one of the first things that comes on the board, what do you know what it is? That's right, create a safe, space. I have no idea what that means. <laughs> we want to create a safe space. I can tell you what I think it means for the people who want it. This is what I think it means for the people who want it. If I am going to share my thoughts, my opinion, my perspective on this very topic, if I'm going to bring to the circle, to the table, whatever it is, what my beliefs are about this or about that. I want to make sure, absolutely sure, that no one is going to contradict me. That no one is going to challenge me. That God forbid my ego may be bruised by somebody who might criticize my point of view. That I may be personally wounded by somebody who would actually perhaps even dismantle my argument to show the error of my ways and offer a different perspective. God forbid that would happen. That would be devastating. I would lose face in front of the people that are in the room with me. And that is something that I cannot stomach or allow to happen. Therefore, let's create and make sure there is sacred space. No, safe space, sorry. Let's make sure this space is safe for my ego. That's really what we mean. That's really what we mean. That's not a safe space, that's a nightmare. That is a space where I have, from the get-go, put so many walls around my, the possibility of my learning anything, that it is not even 
relevant to have that conversation anymore. If we come from the place where everybody has a voice and everybody's got to say and nobody's going to challenge anybody, then it's beautiful. We can hear everybody's point of view and leave the meeting maybe feeling really good about ourselves, pat ourselves on the back. We haven't accomplished anything. Nobody's learned nothing from that moment. This is also so not Jewish. <laughs> can you imagine walking into a yeshiva and going to the Rebbe and saying, I'm happy to study with uh, your students, but what I want to create first is a safe space. You're going to get kicked out, like in the moment. It's like, what do you mean? The way we learn, the way we study is that we, put each, we, we sit in front of each other and we argue to death. We contradict each other. We point, we point out our failures and our, and our shortcomings. Uh, we, we dismantle each other's arguments. We put each other's argument upside down and, and sideways. We open it up. We look into it. We, we, we yell at each other. All for the sake of heaven, it says. All for the sake of heaven. All for the sake of greater learning. We have to step into unsafe space if we want to grow. If we want to learn. If we want to perhaps imagine, change our point of view. Be persuaded that the way we've seen the world until now was too narrow and now we can see it from a different perspective and it becomes broader. It becomes suddenly there is like more. We're never going to get there if we keep a safe space, a safe container for my ego to be able to say what I want to say and never hear back from anybody or any criticism. I just I, I heard just earlier this week on, on NPR this this guy I was actually talking about when he gets the most excited is when he's part of a conversation and suddenly whatever he thought he believed is being completely challenged and so that's when I just get my juices going this is fabulous this is great what I've been thinking all my life about this topic suddenly is being completely challenged. I'm able to kind of assimilate a different thing. Wow, I'm growing, I'm learning, I'm becoming a bigger, better human being. There is power in embracing the unsafe nature of our being in this world. If you are engaged in any kind of meaningful relationship that is worth it, it is probably not a safe space. If you're engaged in any powerful, loving friendship or any kind of relationship with somebody you really care about, you're going to fight, you're going to argue, you're going to have different opinions. That's true. That's a relationship that has integrity. Or you can be in a relationship where you're going to lie to each other and smile at each other all the time and make sure that nobody's ego is bruised. Uh, that's not a real relationship. That's a relationship based on lies. So what kind of relationship do we want to have in this world? And are we willing to transcend our fear of no longer being safe? Because the reality is this world is not safe. It's becoming less and less so by the day. So if we want to really be with what is, which I've been talking about all through the month of September, then we're going to have to embrace the parts of our life, the moments of our life, and we have to acknowledge that as well, where we feel safe, where we feel love, when it's good. And that's only half of the story. And we are going to also be able to embrace and acknowledge that most of life is actually unsafe. Most of what we do every day, if we really think about it, is pretty unsafe. There is no guarantee. We want to control everything, but there is nothing to control. So here's what I wish. I wish that we could engage our kids into meaningful conversations that include both aspects, the unsafe and the safe aspects of their life experience, where they themselves can tell us when are the moments where you feel safe and what are the moments where you don't feel safe. I would want that we actually 
share the statistics maybe that I shared. Because this is reality. We're not amping it up. We're not making it, oh my God, we have to do all about is just close your door, stay home. But it's also about sharing a reality. And then engage them in a conversation to prepare them to face life as it is. I would wish that we would do that with ourselves as well in our places of work, in our places of worship, in our communities, wherever we go. That we allow ourselves to actually meet each other with great integrity and not be afraid from time to time to have a, an argument for the sake of heaven that we actually might have a different perspective on one or two topics. Even here at Bet Aleph, I hope that one day I get to argue with you about something, that we will see something from a completely different perspective. That won't mean that we'll be less friends. That will mean that we'll be best friends, better friends, because of that, because we can argue from a place that I don't have to throw you out of my heart in order to have a meaningful conversation with you. That you are my teacher in that moment. That you share your truth. Now, don't seek arguing with me now. I just, I don't want to, I want to make sure that, oh, what can I, what can I do? To, no, that's not what I'm trying to say. But it is real. And it is true. So let's embrace the unsafe nature of the reality of what it is to be a human being. 